Um, at last, I'm very happy to be with you, well, virtually, not uh, physically, but uh, it's uh, really good. And I hope that you will enjoy the presentation. I, I enjoyed making it. So, you know, I think this will show throughout the, uh, the slides that you will see in the future. My name is Tatiana, Tatiana Tamburadzis. And uh, I uh, am a, an associate professor at the Department of Industrial Management and Technology at the University of Piraeus, uh, which is um, very near Athens in Greece. Uh, I think that some of you may have um, come to Piraeus or been to Piraeus on your way to the Greek islands, perhaps. So it is a, a very nice place to be and it's, uh, it's a really nice atmosphere uh, going to Piraeus. It's, you know, it's a port and people are open and they're smiling, so it's really good. Now, um, I think that we shall start with uh, some physics. So if you remember from school, I mean, I sort of remembered, but I, you know, had an, a good refresher uh, when preparing the presentation. There are four fundamental non-divisible forces in nature. Yeah. So we have gravitational, electromagnetic, strong nuclear and weak nuclear. You can see the slide, can't you? Just making sure. <laughs> Can you see the slide? Yeah, we can see. Oh, okay, great, great. So uh, the first two forces, gravitational and electromagnetic, are long range and they can be experienced in real life, okay? Now, we also have strong nuclear and weak nuclear, which are actually the strongest fundamental forces of nature. So you should think that they are 10 to the power of six, uh, strong um, nuclear um, force is 10 to the power of six times stronger than weak nuclear force. And uh, strong uh, nuclear um, force is 10 to the 38 times stronger than gravitational force. So if you think that gravitational force is really strong, you should think again, okay? The only thing is why we don't experience these uh, two uh, strong and weak nuclear forces uh, is that they operate at the level of subatomic particles, 10 to the minus 15 meters. So we have no idea of what's going on in the nucleus. We don't feel it but they are extremely, extremely strong. So just a few words on uh, the gravitational force and the electromagnetic force. Uh, gravity is a weak force, which has only one sign of charge and going by Newton's law, uh, every particle attracts every other particle in the universe with a force that's directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. This is something we have all learned at school. And to us, it is a, a very strong force, isn't it? Uh, now, electromag uh, electromagnetism, um, it has two aspects electricity and magnetism. And these are unified into the same one and the same phenomenon. So this is why moving electric currents cause magnetic fields, as you know, and magnetic fields induce electric currents to flow. Now, um, in, in 1905, so it's more than a hundred years ago, uh, Albert Einstein and his theory of relativity established that both ele um, electricity and magnetism are aspects of one common phenomenon. Uh, but as we see it and uh, in practice, uh, these two forces are very, very different and described by different equations. They have different descriptions. Uh, however, electric forces are produced by electric charges, either at rest or in motion, and magnetic forces are produced only 
by moving charges, okay? And they act solely on these charges that are in motion. So there's quite a difference. There are, there are two principal differences between gravity and electromagnetism. Uh, and let's go and see them. Gravity is a weak force, but it has only one sign of charge, while gravitational charge is equivalent to inertia. So an electromagnetism is much stronger, but it has two opposing signs of charge, uh, repel or, um, or um, bring together, let's say, and electromagnetic charge is unrelated to inertia. So leaving these forces and coming now to the forces that we're interested in, strong nuclear force um, operates, you can read what I have uh, written here, but I just say that uh, they bind the nucleus together. If it were not for the strong nuclear force, uh, then the protons which are in uh, the nucleus would repel each other and then the, the atom would be broken. It would be, it would dissolve into, into nothing, into, you know, uh, neutrons and uh, protons. So this is what keep them, keeps them together. This is the strongest force of nature. We also have weak nuclear force, okay? And this, um, this force changes neutrons into protons in or during nuclear decay. So when uh, a neutron is uh, changed into a positively charged proton, subatomic particles are released near the speed of light. So these two forces, if you see, can see the next uh, uh, slide, um, actually in order to have an unstable nucleus, uh, one must look at the balance between protons and neutrons. If there are too many neutrons or too many protons, then uh, the binding energy um, decreases and the nucleus becomes unstable, okay? Now, all isotopes of a given element have the same number of protons, but different, oh, sorry, <laughs> different numbers of, wait, of neutrons. So this can make some of the isotopes unstable while the other isotopes are stable. I think this was a, a nice refresher of our high school years, perhaps even university years. Uh, and just to mention, you have all the forces here. And um, these four fundamental forces uh, create, combined, uh, all the other forces, which are called non-fundamental forces. So I think we've had enough of this. Let's go to some nuclear engineering. So we're going uh, towards our target now. We have two kinds of um, interactions. We have nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Okay, so nuclear fi fission is when we have large and stable nuclei, which are um, broken in pieces putting it splitting, but put, you know, broken into pieces. And uh, by this uh, splitting, there is a, a, um, a significant decrease in mass. And due to the mass energy equivalence, um, what happens is lots of energy is released. Now, fission generally occurs when we have unstable and large nuclei. And these are struck by a thermal uh, neutron, which is a, a neutron that has lost most of it, its energy. And when it strikes uh, the nucleus, it causes this phenomenon. Now, in the addition of creating smaller nuclei, uh, neutrons are released. So you have a sustainable phenomenon process or phenomenon okay so this doesn't stop okay uh, now we have 
rather than splitting large and stable nuclei, what can also happen is two small light, that is, nuclei, to come together and form a single uh, heavier nucleus. Now, fusion or again results in release of energy because the mass of the new nucleus is smaller than the sum of the original masses. And you can see uh, two figures. So the one on the left-hand side uh, pertains to nuclear fission and the other one pertains to uh, fusion. And you can see again uh, that there are neutrons that uh, come out of fusion. Is it okay up to now? Any questions, perhaps? Okay, so I also found a very nice picture which uh, shows it much better than the pictures I showed before. So the first one is fission. You can see how uh, the larger atom breaks into uh, two or more um, smaller atoms, uh, atoms, yes, and fusion where two or more atoms uh, come together, join each other, and become one larger uh, atom. Enough about, oh, well, just um, now I'm talking a bit about nuclear reactors because this is, you know, the main interest here. Uh, there's a measure of uh, nuclear activity uh, that is used as a gauge of safe and optimal nuclear power plant operation. And uh, the requirement is for us to have minimal uh, fuel use for maximal energy production. And uh, a measure of this is the neutron flux, which what it, what it measures is the total length traveled by all free neutrons per unit time and volume, let's say in the nuclear power plant. This is how uh, energy, let's say, activity is uh, measured in a nuclear power plant. So now I will show you uh, a cross section, let's say, of uh, a pressurized water reactor. There are many kinds of nuclear reactors. I selected this because it's uh, quite easy to follow. And what happens was, what happens is we have uh, boiling water reactors, pressurized water reaction, reactors, uh, meaning that here we have a pressurized uh, environment, okay? In the other case, the boiling water reactor, we allow water to boil much more than we do with other kinds of reactors. Each construction gives us some advantages and some disadvantages, of course, but aiming at advantages, um, every country and every um, um, let's say, developer of uh, nuclear reactors uh, makes their own choices based on where uh, the uh, reactor is absorbed. Will it have water to pressurize, you know, to use as pressurized water? Because you have to replenish the water all the time. Will water be around then or not? Um, now, looking at the green part of the picture, the green square that encircles uh, the actual core, uh, we can see that we have some black lines, okay? These black lines are control rods. Now, the, the control rods, as you can see on the left-hand side, are used to control the rate of fission uh, during operation. So, uh, the, the composition of these control rods is um, boron, cadmium, silver, indium. So it's elements which uh, absorb neutrons, free neutrons, but they don't fission easily. So they can absorb the neutrons and there's no problem. Now, another way of absorbing uh, neutrons is by moving the, few, the control rods, the black lines, up and down. Uh, oops, sorry. Wait. Up and down. So by moving the control rods down, what happens is fission uh, becomes uh, weaker. 
because the neutrons are absorbed by the control rods. By drawing them up, we have more intense fission. So this is the way of controlling uh, the power plant. And let me say a few more things. Um, in nuclear power plants, okay, the heat source is the nuclear reactor. So heat is, uh, is, is generated in the reactor and this heat is used to generate steam that drives steam turbines, okay, connected to a generator that produces electricity. So this is why we use nuclear power plants, okay? Uh, now, why use uh, nuclear power plants? Because uh, they are, their operation is affordable, uh, the maintenance is also affordable, and the fuel is affordable, believe it or not. Now, the big problem is uh, how to store radioactive waste. This is a long, long going on problem, and uh, there are no basic answers, but all the pros, this, uh, you know, the affordable operation, uh, the fuel which can be found, and maintenance, uh, these make the pluses um, more, to weigh more than the minuses. So now the first commercial, uh, just a few words and we're leaving here. The first commercial power plant started uh, in the 1950s. And now nuclear energy um, is about 10% of the world's electricity. And it comes from about 440 uh, power react nuclear power reactors. And nuclear is the, so the world's second largest uh, source of low carbon power. Uh, over 50 countries utilize uh, new, uh, nuclear energy generated in about 220 research reactors, because there are uh, the real reactors and research reactors. And uh, these reactors, these 220, um, 220 research reactors, are also used for the production of medical and industrial isotopes and for training personnel. So to recap, today's nuclear power comes only from, from nuclear fission. There's no fusion yet. Uh, all nuclear power plants heat water to produce steam. Uh, and this steam is used to spin turbines that generate electricity, okay? So uh, in nuclear fission, atoms are split to form smaller atoms uh, and also release energy. Uh, fission takes place inside the, the reactor, as we saw before, and Oh, in the core, okay, and the core, as we saw before, but it's worth saying again, contains uranium fuel. Now, listen, listen to this. Uh, it, there are ceramic pellet, pellets that are created from the uranium, uranium fuel, and the size is three eighths of an inch in diameter and five eighths of, of an inch in length. And each one of these very, very small pellets produces about the same amount of energy as 150 gallons of oil. So you can all understand why uh, nuclear power plants are in operation and why it will be very hard to not have them, okay? And these pellets are stacked end to end in 12 foot metal fuel rods, the, the, the rods we saw before, not uh, the ones absorbing uh, the neutrons, the other ones I can show you perhaps here. So uh, the red ones are the fuel rods, okay? So it's in there that we have uh, the pellets. Um, okay, so we have uh, 12 foot metal fuel rods. So take these three eighths of an inch and put them in a 12 foot uh, fuel rod, and some with uh, a bundle of fuel rods, some with hundreds of rods, is a fuel assembly, and a reactor core contains many fuel assemblies. So you can imagine uh, the energy, the power, 
that is in a nuclear power plant. Okay, so what, uh, as we said before, uh, the heat produced in the nuclear reactor uh, boils water into steam, which turns the blades of a steam turbine, okay? Um, and nuclear plants cool the steam back into water because you don't want to contaminate lots of water, you see? So you try to use the same water again and again. And uh, this is performed in a cooling tower, okay? Or uh, you, uh, if there are ponds and rivers or the ocean nearby, and this is why many, most of the nuclear reactors are built around ponds and rivers on the ocean. Uh, the cooled water, though, is then reused to produce steam. So it's recycled, basically. Uh, any questions so far? OK, um, so I'll go now to talk about uh, brain physiology and psychophysics, perception, function, and action. So we're going from neutrons to neurons. So we have here the picture of a neuron one, you know, a cell in our brain, um, we can see that it, it looks quite funny, like, uh, you know, something that you would find in the sea. Let's start from the nucleus. The nucleus is the center. It's the nervous system, let's say, of uh, the neuron, and it controls the entire, or the brain, we could also say, of uh, the, neur the neuron, and it controls the entire neuron from function to inputs and outputs, as we will see. Now, there's the cell body, this yellow thing around the nucleus, and we can see that we have like uh, branches coming out of uh, the cell body. These are dendrites, which receive signals from other uh, cells which are connected with our cell here. Uh, so the, the information passes from the dendrite, from the dendra, from the other neurons, which are connected to the neuron, via dendrites. Now, they are processed by the nucleus, and uh, there is one terminal here, the axon, you see? So there are many, many dendrites, but only one axon. Uh, which has myelin sheath to increase the speed of the signal. And myelin sheath is very, very important. People who um, are losing myelin sheath have uh, many neurological problems. It's one of the causes of uh, uh, many, many neurological problems. Um, so uh, the signals that are received from the dendrites uh, are summed together, and then they are moved through the axon to the axon terminals. The axon terminals uh, are junctions with other cells. So if the signal is strong enough, there's a threshold, then the axon will take, um, will have an impulse, and it will, uh, this will go to the axon terminal, and then uh, information or in the form of firing uh, uh, axon terminals will commu be communicated to the connected um, neuron. Okay, so this is how um, information is processed in the brain and the, the, the uh, central ner nervous system, of course. And you can see here a synapse. So where um, uh, the axon um, communicates with a synapse of the other uh, neuron, okay? So you can see it's a chemical phenomenon, basically, having to do with calcium, basically. And the firing rate is proportional to the intensity of the stimulus. So we go from uh, time to frequency. And this is basically how it happens. Now, Let's go to our natural neural networks, the brain. And we will do this because the networks we're going to talk about uh, in two or three minutes um, are inspired and mimic uh, the functions that I will uh, talk, to, talk to you about now. Now, uh, in neuroscience, 
it's very difficult to understand what each brain, uh, each brain area does. It's, it's difficult even to tell brain areas apart. So what we, and I have done that as well when I was uh, doing my PhD, it was interesting to see um, which brain area is actually affected by how uh, a malfunctioning in our performance, be it vision, be it um, reasoning, is manifested. So uh, what goes wrong uh, in cognition behavior, the ability to move, to see, to perceive, and so on, uh, this shows us um, what is going on in which area of the brain. Of course, many people have come before us uh, who have made uh, graphs, you know, and maps of the brain. But um, this is how it works. You can't, uh, you don't have any other signs, but what is not as it should be or as it would be normal given a stimulus that we, you know, we present to the, to the patient, let's say. And from this, we understand, we, we rule out things that can't be happening. And then we understand what is uh, the matter with the patient. So uh, let's go to the primary visual area, which is area 17. And as happens with all the brain, the, the, all the uh, areas in our brain, the left uh, cortical areas correspond to the right eye, hand, uh, liver, whatever, uh, and vice versa. So the left cortical areas project to the right, to, to the left, to the right, and the right to the left. And the primary purpose is to receive, segment, and integrate visual information. So all areas work together. Uh, now, V1 this area creates a saliency map so it highlights what is important of the view the visual stimuli that are uh, projected uh, to our brain via our eyes so what happens is there are very very rapid movements of the eye you can see this uh, which uh, shift attention from one area that might be interesting to another very, very quickly. And these inputs are transformed into neural firing rates, as we saw before, okay? So that the visual location, which is the most salient, uh, wins. And this attracts the, the gaze at that point in time. Um, Okay, and V1 has a very well-defined map of the spatial information that's captured by our eyes. Uh, so it creates a, the same, no, and saccades, you might have heard these, are very fast conjugate eye movements that shift the eyes from one target to the other. So we can find, locate, identify first of all, and locate the, the, stimulus that is the most important. So let's say if there's a uh, fight or flight uh, thing, uh, the eyes are working and they send a signal that this is really salient, this is really bad, and it's the flee, the fight, the flight, not the uh, fight um, uh, response. And this happens in less than 100 milliseconds. So it's really fast, okay? Um, I think, yes, we said this, we have covered this. Um, okay. And then we have the last area that we'll talk about, area 39, as you can see here. And this is just interesting, and that's why I, am, I have included it. Uh, so if uh, the left hemisphere of the brain is damaged in area 39, uh, the patient might, might demonstrate dyslexia or semantic aphasia, doesn't understand what we mean when we say something. He understands the words, but he can't understand the, the, the meaning or why this is said. If the damage is on the right, uh, on the right side, on the other hand, uh, electrical stimulation of the right angular gyrus uh, induces an out-of-body experience. 
Okay, so uh, one fun fact is that Albert Einstein had fewer neurons relative to glial cells than normal in this area. I found it interesting. So now let's go to uh, more to close to our subject, computational intelligence and deep neural networks. So we saw the parts of the neuron of a neuron and its functions. And now we go to the artificial neuron and the neural network that you can see on the left hand side. So it is quite similar. You see, we have uh, layers of uh, nodes, uh, which are neurons, let's say, and they are as, a as, as, as usual, especially in backpropagation and in deep neural networks, uh, full connection uh, between the nodes of uh, subsequent uh, layers. And uh, what happens is the neuron, it receives the inputs, x1, x2, and so on, sums them, and then there's a threshold, not a linear threshold, it takes different uh, forms. And if uh, the activation, the sum of the in, in, um, individual uh, activations is larger than the threshold, then we get a response. Otherwise, we do not. Now, we can get the response as the sum, or we can get the response as a one versus zero. So there are different um, encodings. And so we have different um, neural network architectures. Now, I'll just show you uh, two beautiful pictures because they show how close and how far we are from actually um, simulating neurons. I think you, you, like, you would like this picture. And I think you will like this one, which looks more, well, a bit more like a, an artificial neural network. Now, Back to, to what we were uh, actually talking about. Uh, neutron, neurons sorry, are aggregated into layers, as we saw before, and different layers uh, may perform different transfor transformation of the inputs they receive. But what happens is we go from the first layer, the input layer, to the first hidden, second hidden, and so on, and so on, until we reach the output layer. The output layer, this gives a response that, you know, uh, is calculated. And if we find that this is not correct, during training, we change it by going backwards and finding the gradient and uh, changing uh, the weights between neurons, neurons of different layers accordingly. Okay, ah, and we can also have uh, recurrent connections in recurrent neural networks, but we will not uh, go into this now. Now, uh, with neural networks, I'm trying to explain why we have deep neural networks, how they came about. There is a universal approximation theorem that says that if you have an appropriate number of hidden nodes in a single layer, then a three-level uh, neural network, backpropagation neural network, can solve any problem, okay? It can represent any problem, any function, and we can have correct uh, outputs from giving uh, inputs, and the outputs would be always, always correct. Now, uh, this means that we have to find the number of neurons that we must have in the hidden layer in order to do this. If we have, if we don't have enough uh, new neurons, hidden neurons in the hidden layer, then we will not be able to do a good approximation. If we have far too many, some of the weights will not be well defined, and then uh, again we will not have a good uh, a good result. So. We always have to search. And this, I have done it years ago, and I found it ex extremely tiring, which made me change and go to a different kind of uh, uh, neural network that I was working, different kinds, but especially one. Now, so, uh, the, so while a three-layer backpropagation can be assigned weights that approximate any function, this function might not be learnable by a backpropagation. So this is how deep neural networks uh, came about. 
because they can learn effectively from back propagation, but having these many layers, hidden layers, they could approximate practically anything. Also, they show space invariance and they have a shared weight architecture and translation invariance as well. So I think, you know, it's a win-win situation. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, now, uh, why do we have deep and not wide neural networks? Because complexity in neural networks grows exponentially with depth, as opposed to polynomially with width. So we could, of course, have a very wide a wide neural network rather than a high neural network or tall neural network, as they say, or deep neural network, which is the, um, the established uh, term. But the number of nodes required in this hidden, single hidden layer would be intractable. OK, so this is why I mean, now, you know why we go for deep rather than wide neural networks. I think this is a very important thing that's not uh, usually discussed, even in uh, lectures for uh, MSc students. Now, uh, we have deep neural networks, and one of the uh, most popular categories is the convolutional neural network, which takes it its um, inspiration from the visual cortex. That's why I was talking about the visual cortex before. So neurons respond to stimuli within a restricted region of the visual field. Okay, and these regions overlap for covering uh, in a very practical yet uh, foolproof way because there's always one or two neurons that are in, and more in the same part, you know, looking at the same thing. Uh, so they are robust, they require little preprocessing, okay, uh, and they actually learn the filters, the equations, or, you know, the formulae that uh, lead from the inputs to the outputs. And they're independent of pion knowledge or human effort. So feature extraction is done automatically. Okay, so this is uh, a big pro. Um, now, sorry. Uh, CNNs, I don't know what that was, are, uh, may have dozens of layers at least. So they are part of uh, deep learning, but they, you can have CNNs with uh, fewer uh, layers as well, and they still do their job well. So, because we should have the simplest possible model for our uh, task. Um, okay. So, uh, because of this un unfolding that they uh, propagate uh, things in time, uh, CNNs, uh, convolutional neural networks, are very good at speech recognition in time and la na natural language process processing. So now, uh, some uh, time for applications to nuclear engineering and technology, finally. So uh, a widely accepted classification of nuclear power plant issues is uh, fusion, control, diagnostics, monitoring, um, nuclear power plant operations, proliferation and resistance, sensor component, reliability, and spectroscopy. This is uh, a classification that holds. So we are interested now in what is the potential advancement in the state of the art uh, that we can make to the state of the art by employing uh, deep neural networks including uh, convolution and neural networks on each class. I'm not showing each class. What I, what I did was I uh, took all the recent publications from two top nuclear energy journals, Annals of Nuclear Energy and Progress in Nuclear Energy. You can see them here. They have some differences. I have them. Um, okay. Um, sorry. I did something wrong here. Okay. Um, it's here. I will not go through this uh, now, but we will see some differences in uh, the examples we'll see uh, now. So, first category diagnostics and fault detection. 
if we go to an A and E and a P and E publication, um, we see that we do both uh, perform fault diagnosis. Okay, and they one uses a convolutional uh, recurrent neural network, and the other uses deep learning, a deep learning network. Now, you will observe that there is PSO all the time. This is particle swarm optimization, and it is done so as to find the optimal parameter values that we need in order to uh, set up our uh, neuro deep neural network, okay? So the advantages are that we have real-time uh, application, uh, speedy extraction of local characteristics, okay? And uh, we have the particle swarm optimization for adapting, as I said, the parameters of uh, the, the neural network that we're using. And it's similar things with the progressing nuclear energy, though you will see that the, the, the articles in this journal are usually simulation data rather than experimental. Okay, and four types of faults and performance was really, really good. Now let's go to monitoring. Oops, oh, here, monitoring. So uh, you can see again, annals and uh, progress. Uh, the annals uh, example I'm showing you uh, improves radioactivity monitoring. Uh, so it uses a convolutional neural network that is uh, swift at recognizing, and it's uh, very accurate as well, okay? Even for low counts of gamma, ray, um, gamma rays, low rates, the, the data is again simulated, and we get improved identification accuracy, uh, for different gamma ray spectra, different times, distances, and also a very good uh, mixed radioactive source uh, identification, okay? Now, uh, with progress in nuclear energy, um, we have big data, and as they say, a deep neural network is the only way to go about finding fault faults in monitoring systems online, okay? So uh, online cross correlations are used between real and simulation data. When we mean online, we mean that we take a window and you, we move it uh, by one step very, very rapidly. So the step should be uh, uh, as, you know, uh, each new, uh, new uh, piece of data that we get. So if the sampling rate is 20, we will get 60 over 20 um, uh, different signals. Now, uh, they use code again, relapse thermal code, and the, the accuracy uh, is very, very high. I'll show you another one um, for different mo modes of operation regimes. So they're better than anything that had been uh, created so far. And the last one, proliferation and resistance, this is important, is nuclear proliferation is the spread of nuclear weapons, okay? Fissionable material uh, and weapons applicable nuclear technology also. So we can steal technology, not just weapons and information to nations that are not recognized as nuclear weapon states, okay, by the treaty. Um, the International Atomic Energy Agency was established in 1957 to help uh, develop nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. So uh, it, this means that we can't leave anything out of the reactor. Everything has to be monitored. Even exhausted fuel cannot be left alone, okay? So it has to be stored. And everything must be accounted for. If something is lost, it should be known immediately to the entire community, okay? And um, exactly, uranium should not be enriched with, beyond what is necessary for commercial civil plants, okay? And plutonium, which is produced by neuron, uh, by uh, react nuclear reactors, should not be refined into a form that could be used for, you know, as a weapon. So 
proliferation and resistance. So we have um, intrusion detection systems in uh, annals, and it's a real-time application. Use optical and thermal cameras to detect under any kind of weather. Uh, if you read the paper, you will see what they're doing. Uh, moving objects are followed and segmented into binding, bounding boxes. So there's a long term, so it uses history, time history, recurrent convolutional neural network for classifying intruders against wild animals and so on into five different types. And the last one, which I say for, you know, best is the best, um, is using deep learning for optimizing categorization of ra radioactive waste. Uh, proliferation and resistance from the previous slide, you understand it, we should be really careful. So it's a real data validation. And the if you can see the neural network, the deep learning neural network, the deep network, has been trained on 86,000 images, okay? And it only took the network 50 epochs in order to be able to separate four typical radioactive kinds of waste. And if you look at the numbers, 99.67% correct identification over more than 2,500 images, uh, is indicative. So questions, thank you so much MLSC 2021 for uh, the invitation. And I hope that you find some of what I, you know, presented interesting. Thank you. <laughs>